Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're talking, I guess, mainly about carbon. And uh, my uh, brief was to talk about meaningful uh, reductions in emissions. So basically, we're talking about energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, let's first of all raise the issue about new buildings, new construction. We probably have 1% to 2% turnover in cities for new buildings. I think in terms of improving the energy performance of new buildings, regulations can set uh, quite, quite higher standards than we do currently. So I don't see uh, new buildings as, as being the, the answer to uh, immediate and significant carbon reductions over the short term. So I'd like to focus, if I may, on existing buildings are far more problematic. Let's then separate two kinds of buildings, uh, certainly for cities. We have residential buildings and we have commercial institutional buildings. In most cities we have relatively few industrial buildings, although we do have industrial uh, facilities of course, but I'll focus on... Uh, no good? Not very good? Sorry. This one? Okay. So let's just look at residential buildings. And I think the problem we have here is, is twofold. First of all, uh, cities like Hong Kong uh, are rich cities. So there are lifestyle issues for people in Hong Kong. And you know that if you look at the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, relatively speaking, energy is only about 2 3% of household expenditure. So you put these two things together. And you'll find that uh, in many studies that have been done in residential homes in Hong Kong, in the summertime, we have people who still wear pajamas and use quilts, turning the thermostat on the air conditioner down to 18. Perhaps it's something to do with the fact that air conditioning in Cantonese simply means cold air. So the problem we have with perhaps the residential sector, uh, existing residential buildings, is probably an education issue. Let me leave that aside and move on to commercial uh, institutional buildings. Buildings such as this one, the five-star hotels, the grade-A office buildings, I think these are, tend to be the targets for most uh, initiatives for existing buildings. But of course, we also have grade B office buildings, grade C uh, buildings. We have also schools and various others. So they, there may be quite a variety of building types that we, we need to pay attention to. The problem, first problem I would suggest to understand is that if we talk about a building like this one, most buildings, it could be that the users, the tenants, us, inside these buildings are responsible for at least 50% of the energy consumption of that building. So I sometimes uh, feel, uh, uh, you know, reluctant to blame owners of buildings for poor energy performance. Certainly the audits that we've done is to say that sometimes energy intensities are very high when we look at the activities that are taking place. In a service-based economy, we have a lot of dealing rooms, we have a lot of data center type places, and we have people using a lot of computers as well. So first point that we would make is if we are targeting the existing building energy performance, let's remember tenant activities. You would know that in many buildings such as this one, tenancies may only last for a few years. So there's also the change in churn that takes place in buildings, which also complicates them. If I would be looking at a building such as this one, most of the complication are people in the building. It's always people that are to blame. It's people that are to blame for uh, base building design, which may be oversized, badly controlled, inadequate metering. Okay. <laughs> I think she should hold it for me. Okay. Um, inadequate metering. So very often we have a, a situation that we go into very large buildings and this basically you don't know where the energy is going. So there are design issues. Coupled to the fact that in Hong Kong, we do not test drive buildings before we occupy them. Okay? In the UK building regulations, you are required to commission a new building before you actually 
sign off or occupy it. That's one thing that could be added to our local regulations when it comes to new construction. So what, what we are left with very often looking at these buildings is that perhaps the original design does not adequately match the current use because of change in churn, because of different uh, uh, changes to uh, activities in the building. For example, the, if you know Island Center in Causeway Bay, the first five floors were changed from offices to restaurants. So that has implications on the building performance. So we don't road test buildings very well. Consequently, our current buildings are not optimized in performance. The problem comes when we want to look at optimizing the performance of the building, we need to engage both the landlord and the tenant. Often there is a friction, frictional relationship between these two parties. Uh, if you're looking at a fit out exercise in some buildings and you try to engage the landlord's team on certain aspects of the base building performance, we often come up against uh, barriers because they don't want to reveal inadequacies that they have on their side of the building. So there's a lot of issues associated with people, relationships within buildings, which are the problem to overcome, not the technical issues, often it's the relationship issues. If I then look at staying with existing buildings, looking at what might happen to our existing building stock to improve it, I think there are basically three levels of action one would take. Obviously, old buildings, we have a lot of old buildings. You're talking basically about demolishing them or completely refurbishing them. Now, that's a a major issue, of course, and once you start talking about refurbishment, you're actually talking basically about a new building design. The second th level of action within our existing buildings would probably be the replacement of aging equipment. For example, chiller plants may be 20 years life, maybe if they're approaching 20, 25 year life, maybe we're talking about replacement of major plants. Very often, it's a replacement of control systems and equipment in the building for the, some of the reasons I've mentioned earlier. So this retrofit can be an action that could be taken in quite a few uh, buildings, buildings of the age of perhaps 20 years and that sort. When we come on to the newer buildings, buildings that have only been around for a few years, bearing in mind that they weren't commissioned properly, probably, in our experience, then we would advocate recommissioning these buildings. Essentially, we're talking about a process that you, 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 you use with your motor cars. Every year, we tend to have testing on motor cars to make sure that they're running efficiently and the brakes work and so on and so forth. We don't do this frequently enough for buildings. So recommissioning a lot of fairly new buildings would bring us uh, some fairly substantial uh, advantages when it comes to energy reduction. I can quote uh, studies done in the US where a median gain on recommissioning a large number of buildings is 15%. 15% is quite a large percentage when you, talk of, when you compare it with targets for renewable energy percentage. I think our government's renewable energy percentage increased by 1% every year for the next 10 years. I'm looking at 15% gain on a building like this one within 12 months. That's the message that I have. Drivers for these changes, regulations are for new buildings. Certainly we should include proper road testing of our buildings before they're occupied as the UK regulations and also I understand in the US the General Services Agency which is basically a federal agency also requires their buildings to be commissioned properly so that, uh, when I compare building regulations in this part of the world with Arnold Schwarzenegger's California building regulations we are somewhat behind for me, California has got some pretty exemplary practices when it comes to regulation. 
for existing buildings, very briefly. Existing buildings are always outside the regulatory framework of governments because it's difficult. I think the best uh, example that we can try and adopt is shame game, the shame game. Essentially, what you do is make sure that the regulations state that you must declare the energy performance of your building publicly. I think some of you are familiar with the uh, branding or grading of refrigerators, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. Apparently, in Europe, you cannot sell a refrigerator nowadays, which is below grade C. In Europe, they have building energy labeling, and one excellent idea, or two excellent ideas, I guess. One, the first excellent idea is before you can lease, sell, rent, or whatever a building, you must declare the label according to European standards. The second idea, which has not been implemented yet, but could be a good idea, is if you are below grade D, you cannot lease or rent the building until you upgrade the performance. So there is the potential through fairly simple regulations to improve the existing building stock. In conclusion, the problem we have is probably if we try to do a lot of action on our existing building stock, we don't have the people who can do it because we don't train people to do, to do the very work that we need to do. What we have in the universities, and I'm an ex-pro from the universities, what we have in the universities in Hong Kong is the education and training of many designers. We don't have education and training of people who actually test and commission buildings, and we don't have much training for operation and maintenance people who actually run the buildings. Thank you.